freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. The only way they can inherit the freedom we have known is if we fight for it, protect it, defend it, and then hand it to them with the well-taught lessons of how they in their lifetime must do the same. And if you and I don't do this, then you and I may well spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it once was like in America when men were free. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Gun Freedom Radio, where we engage, we educate, and we inform. We are brought to you by azfirearms.com, your nationwide hometown gun shop. I am one of your hosts, Cheryl Todd. And I'm the other guy, Dan Todd. Our theme of our show today is Your Vote Counts. And our guest is Norin Eric Bruden. Eric is an Arizona candidate for U.S. Congress. He is a self-made entrepreneur after our own hearts, uh, owner of Essential Pest Control, owner of The Hitting Factory, which is an indoor baseball facility. He is a former Tea Party activist and is a Congressional District 2 candidate for Tucson, Arizona. Welcome to the show, Eric. Thank you for having me. Glad to be here. Well, we are always excited to talk to citizens who have made that big step, that big important step uh, to put their hat in the ring and run for public office because, holy cow, that can be a pretty rough arena. So we very much appreciate uh, that you have made that step. And uh, just before we dive into our, our list of, of questions, what was it that, you know, was the impetus for you that you said, all right, I, I can't sit on the sidelines. I got to dive in. Yeah, well, you know, I, I'm just a local that started from the bottom, uh, working my way up. And fortunately, I got a good industry that worked, uh, rewarded hard work in the pest control industry, which you know, eventually led to me owning my own business and uh, being able to give back to my community. I volunteered with my community for probably 10 plus years now, you know, coaching softball, helping out, giving to local charities and, you know, serving my community and seeing the problems that we have. Um, you know, I thought that there needed to be more business folks out there. You know, we talk about Trump being a business guy, but there's not a lot of business support in Congress and the Senate and having people that just want to have some common sense solutions to help the little guy out there. You know, hardworking folks just want a helping hand and, you know, understanding a little bit about numbers and the economy. I think that helps us all. And, you know, that was kind of the motivation for running because I had real fears in Southern Arizona that uh, if I hadn't jumped in this race, you know, with uh, O'Halloran in District 1 and Kirkpatrick in 2 and Grijalva in 3 and, you know, Cinema's our new senator and the struggles we're having at the other senatorial race, there was a real possibility that we didn't have any representation in Southern Arizona for Congress, and that really worried me. So that was kind of the motivation for jumping into this race. You know, you mentioned business, and, I, and I've always wondered how a person could elected to a large, you know, like congressman or president or anything with no business background. How, yep. how do they do that? Because you're essentially running our, our country, right? Yeah. Well, you know, a lot of them are lawyers or people that have political degrees. That's what they've gone to school for. So somewhere in academia that they thought they could create a, a political science program. But political science doesn't really deal with a lot of uh, budgets and monetary issues. And what people need to understand is that every piece of legislation that goes through has some type of monetary component of spending, either to motivate behavior, to decrease behavior, and a budget tied to it. So if we go from the bigs of Social Security and Medicare, just to local ordinances and enforcement with uh, local people in town, there is always a budgetary cost. And not to have a strong understanding of finances is um, pretty ludicrous to me, but th that's why I'm running. Awesome. So you'd run it like you run your home. You know, if you have the money, you spend it. If you don't have the money, you don't spend it. Right. <laughs> yeah, and maybe save a little bit for a rainy day like COVID. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, speaking of COVID and speaking of really where we are 
in uh, kind of the, the, the moment in history. We're sitting in the studio, we're recording on Monday, June 8th, 2020. And, you know, sometimes people stumble on these recordings many years later, and, and sometimes they're a little disoriented if I don't kind of tell them, well, okay, what's happening right now that we're having these discussions? Um, we are trying to open back up as a nation, trying to open up Arizona. Um, and as we do that, I, I mean, there's a huge, um, you know, we keep talking about this curve with the cases of COVID. What about the curve for the economic recovery that we hope is going to uh, happen, that we're going to start going, you know, up and to the right again uh, with our um, ability to serve our our neighbors with our businesses, our small businesses, and you know really get things rolling again. What can a a person do that is seeking the office that you are that can positively impact that economic recovery? Well, that's going to have to be done at all levels, from a local, state, and federal level. So I'm really speaking about the federal level. So as a business owner, uh, I own two businesses, one that was shut down during this entire process. So I, I know what that feels like. Another one that was deemed an essential business as a pest control company that continued to operate, but ended up having their revenue slashed by 30% because people just didn't want us at their homes and their concerns. So I, I kind of see it on both sides. And I also saw from a legislative standpoint that when the CARES Act was passed and the payroll protection program was put out, it really didn't address a lot of the financial issues that small businesses ended up having. And actually a larger business has gobbled up many of the funds before the small business folks could even actually get to the program. But basically it was a, um, a protection program for the employees, basically an employment program. The, the funds, most of them, 75%, had to be used just for payroll issues. Well, if you're a restaurateur, yeah, so you have money for payroll, but do you have money for you know paying the rent to the facility? If you have no revenue coming in and you can't pay utilities, you can't pay for your food product, can't pay for anything else, um, you're gonna go out of business. So it doesn't really matter if you can fund employees or not fund employees. So there was no latitude for those small business folks. And then if you look at the rest of the spending across the board, very little of it had to do with business recovery. And it was basically a distribution program. And again, for employment. And then when you look at the unemployment benefits that were put out, um, especially in Tucson where our wages are economically depressed, uh, it was actually more cost advantageous for someone to go on employment than it was to actually go to work. So when they're giving that you know, magical $15 an hour and a 600 on top of your state benefits of additional 240, then they were actually making more uh, staying at home. So that didn't motivate people to get back to work, open the economy. So really it just showed a lack of knowledge of businesses, how they work, the economy work, and the funding really didn't go where it needed to go for us to be successful. So I think from a legislative standpoint, we need to have better policy that's put together that's a little bit more targeted uh, for those small business folks, and then putting caps to make sure the money goes exactly where it's supposed to go. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, in our businesses, we had an, we do have an auction house. Of course, mm -hmm. that's a meeting space. That was uh, a no-go. And then we have yep. a gun shop. And so, of course, the gun shop is essential. And we did appreciate that the, uh, the federal government and the state government did deem us as essential. And I like to tell people just because they said it, that's not why it's true. It's true. And thank you for saying it. Right? So, but that the the loan that they gave us, we we did apply for that PPP loan, mm -hmm. and they gave us basically it's two and a half pay periods, mm -hmm. and that's that wasn't I mean enough. I mean, we have a rainy day fund, just as everybody should have if you can, and so we were able to uh, keep all of our uh, employees uh, working, employers employees working, but it. I, I don't know how a lot of businesses could hold on because they still have rent. They still have utilities. You can't shut everything down. You can't, you, you can't shut it down and then later start it back up again that easy. So it's, it's really hard. And I, I feel bad for a lot of people that didn't make it. So. That's yeah. so true. Um, go ahead, Aaron, Eric. Well, I, I, I'm just saying that there, there's a lot of pain out there 
for a lot of people. And there's many uh, businesses across the board, they're just not going to come back. I mean, right. just here in our local region, you know, JC Penney, a big, large retail retailer, they said they're closing three stores. They're not going to continue to open. And then I have the mom and pop restaurants that, you know, you go to for years. They're not opening either. So it's big and small that's being affected. And, you know, our retailers and who we have is going to look a little bit different after this process. And, you know, a lot of people it just seems at the federal level like picking winners and losers. And unfortunately, there's a lot of people have lost throughout this entire event. And I, I really believe this COVID response was handled wrong. Um, you know, the response was to shut down everything instead of protecting the vulnerable groups that are out there. Could we had a response that quarantined and isolated the vulnerable versus isolating everyone? And there just wasn't a lot of care and consideration put out there you know, within our response. And I wish we could have done a better job. Well, if there is that second wave, that second spike that um, some are predicting, uh, hopefully now that we have experienced, because I mean, I've had to give a lot of grace to uh, pretty much everyone, <laughs> uh, whether I've agreed with their, their tactics or not, because this is the first time the, the world has ever experienced something like this. Um, and uh, I, I have seen uh, quite a few uh, elected officials way overreach. Um, and uh, at first I, I was offering them grace because, you know, I'm thinking, well, they just, this is the first time they're not sure what to do. And, and now it feels like it's gone on long enough that I'm starting to smell politics in the air uh, with the way people are responding and, and use of power rather than being public servants. And that's something I always like to ask um, people who are either already an elected official or running for a, 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 an office to be an elected official is, um, you know, just kind of that, that distinction between, and what does that distinction mean to you between being a politician versus a public servant? Yeah, I, I think it really comes down to is you have to realize mother nature has been around for a very long time. And I would have a slight disagreement in the sense that we have experienced this, uh, you know, H1N1, SARS, uh, Spanish flu, you know, we've had unknowns that we've had to deal with. Uh, you talk about a second wave. Um, yeah, it's going to reemerge, there's no doubt, but now that we're opening up, then we can develop our herd immunity so that we can be better prepared as a society. Um, you know, we're gonna hopefully have some drugs that are available that can help. Um, it's a situation that uh, I, I think we'll be able to respond better in the future. So one of the things is, I'm going to steal a line from a friend of mine that he's out there is, when you're doing public policy, you have to balance the freedom and the interest of people to be able to run their lives on a daily basis with safety. You know, we can make the perfect car that is 100% safe, it looked like a tank and you could only drive five miles an hour and have big bumpers on it and no one would ever die in a car death ever again in the United States. But then there's the efficiency of you can't have a transportation system going across the country because you can never get there. Uh, the efficiencies of going to work and being able to do the things, having recreational vehicles that people can go out and enjoy. You know, somebody is a car enthusiast and likes to go fast, they can't do that. You know, so, you know, there's give and take anytime that you have public policy. And, you know, when you're talking about disease vector control, you know, there is a need for a herd immunity. There is a need to uh, make our society stronger so that we can resist these things, but there's also a need to protect. So again, that goes back to protecting the vulnerable and then acclimating the population as quickly as possible so we stop future spread uh, down the road. Absolutely. So um, with, with the role that you would like to play, uh, you'd like to be hired by the voters uh, to, to serve at the, uh, as a District 2 Congressional um, a congressperson. So what would you, how would you be able to impact small businesses and economic development specifically? Are there, are there just generalities as far as like, well, let's try to remove regulations or are there specific things that you can impact? Actually, I think there are very specific things. I think as a legislator, you got to look for your opportunities. Now I am 
very much a budget and reduce spend type of guy, but I also think there is positive spending as well. And that's when you look at your economic region and see if there's advantages and opportunities that you can end up utilizing. For example, um, we have a great opportunity here in Southern Arizona. We have a natural freeway system that connects us to Texas. We have a natural freeway system with the eight going to California and then obviously going to Phoenix all the way up through to Canada. Uh, we also have a workforce and opportunity as well. So if we can improve some of our infrastructure, upgrades our ports of entry, we can increase a lot of trade with Mexico. Obviously we want border security where we stop the negative behavior of illegal trafficking of people and drugs, but we also wanna have a big economic gate. And what most people don't realize is we have $700 billion worth of trade with Mexico annually. 300 is American jobs, American goods going down south. So when we talk about having a negative trade partner in China, and obviously they've been dishonest throughout this entire process. Can we bring those goods and those products closer to home? Because if we're being realistic, not all products will be made in America. Obviously we want as many as possible, but I think that economic trade would help out a lot. And as a federal representative, if I can provide the funds and opportunity to help increase that, and then that trickles down throughout the entire economy where we can draw in more businesses into our region, and it actually helps some of our small business folks because there are opportunities that they can take advantage of. So I try to look for policy ideas that will actually drive a economic engine of empowerment and that was kind of what I'd like to focus on at the next level. Very good. Uh, you know, we understand as uh, small business owners that we don't get to just invent money out of the thin air and um, I, I have to believe that, you know, as, as well-meaning as the CARES Act is and the PPP and all of that, I feel that, you know, there wasn't a budget already in place. There wasn't money already sitting uh, they're waiting to, to share with uh, those of us that have received it. And so as we start having to figure out, are we paying back a debt or are we dealing with um, inflation or recession? Like whatever this is going to happen, uh, however this is going to impact us financially, small business owners, we are the backbone of this nation. We are the financial uh generators and we are going to feel it at some level and so i'm i'm encouraged that there are people like yourself who are running for office and and will be part of that conversation so that we aren't just seen as a you know a, a tree they can harvest and just start you know over harvesting from us to help uh repair the the hole that we've put in the the federal budget yeah, there, there's obviously a disconnect uh, when it comes to spending and where that money is coming from. We can't print money indefinitely. And, you know, it used to be back in the day that when we provided funds for something, it was for a goal or for a project. It was an interstate highway. It was for Hoover Dam. There was a tangible result that served the community for many, many years. But sometimes with these spending programs, you know, when you're sending money to the Kennedy Center or just blank checks out to people, or even the HEROES Act, which is anything but, you know, you're saying, hey, we're going to give money to illegals. We're going to extend those unemployment benefits for people to stay home all the way through the end of the year. You know, there's not a tangible result that comes out of some of that spending. And unfortunately, one of the motivations for me for running for Congress is, you know, for years I've been helping young people try to get to college. And, you know, I try to tell them, oh, go get your college degree and, you know, life's going to be better. But there was part of me that felt like I was a little disingenuous because I see real struggles for that next generation. And if we don't continue to, or if we continue and don't address uh, this out of control spending, eventually, the money's gonna run out and printing is just gonna create massive inflation and we're gonna look like Greece. And you know, I, I know we're disturbed right now with riots and civil unrest, but there's gonna be even greater emphasis and people hurling bottles and doing terrible things, you know, in Washington DC as people revolt because we can no longer fund social security or Medicare or entitlement programs or whatever, at whatever you want. Uh, when you run out of the money and everybody's used to being on that money, uh, it creates a bad situation, and we can prevent that with just a little bit of fiscal policy. Eric, aren't we already out of money? Theoretically, yeah. I mean, I mean right if, now. You know, I mean, trillions of dollars in debt, 
And, yeah. you know, so we're already out. But, yeah. Well, there is that flow, right? I think that the government operates on that m financial flow, money in and pay money Peter out. Pay Paul but or whatever, yeah. that kind of thing. But there's still a huge deficit out there. And speaking of a deficit, um, Arizona is a retirement state. Many, yep. many people come here. Uh, they used to come here because our air was so good. Uh, and, you know, people that had any kind of uh, allergies or breathing issues, they would uh, come to Arizona and, and we would, you know, help that with that. Uh, but now people have brought their plants with them. So now we, they, don't, they don't necessarily come here for that, but they do come here to retire. And, um, you know, we, we have great weather. We have great freedoms. We have um, beautiful recreation. Uh, so people can get out and enjoy uh, nature in all different seasons and all different climates um, with the different elevations across the, the, uh, the state. Um, but many of these people, they have to rely on their, their Social Security. And Social Security was something that it was a savings account, basically, that people paid into. And now that they're ready to say, okay, it's my turn. I think there's a tremendous amount of insolvency going on there. And with Medicare, that's another program that's so important to, to people yeah. of retirement age. What can you say um, about those things and how you can, uh, how your understanding of them and how you can positively impact uh, should you be hired to the position through people's votes that you're seeking? Yeah, I'll, I'll mix in two things because uh, Dan mentioned we're out of money. Mm -hmm. You know, we're operating basically, you know, in business, we'll call it the float, you know, the, the revenue that comes in by the time the check goes out. And that's mm -hmm. how we're, because when you're in deficit, that's basically what you're doing on an annual basis. Social Security is very interesting in that standpoint, because before COVID, and I'm emphasizing before, 2020 was going to be the first year that we took in less revenue for Social Security that went out for expenditures. And that basically comes from payroll taxes. So the proverbial death spiral that we talk about uh, had started. And I don't think most people realize that. And uh, according to the Congressional Budget Office, these aren't my numbers, it's their numbers, that in 2035, Social Security would be insolvent. And within six years, Medicare would be insolvent. Now, when I say insolvency, I, I don't want to scare people. It just means that we have no more of that fund to rely on, and we have to solely rely on the money coming in on an annual basis from payroll taxes. So people's benefits would go from 100% basically down to 79% almost instantly. So one of the scary things about this COVID situation that I don't think people are even talking about and seeing the long-term impact is you shut down businesses for several months, then those payroll taxes aren't being paid. You know, and I know we talk about tax holidays and those sort of things sound good, but again, payroll taxes not being paid. So I saw an interesting article from the Wharton School of Business, and they actually changed that estimate from 2035. They believe that Social Security could be insolvent as early as 2029. That's nine years away. And that, that's a scary thing. What's important from a congressional standpoint, and what people don't realize is that Social Security and Medicare basically get auto renew, renewed every single year. It's not like Congress takes a new vote. Uh, about 60% of the budget operates that way. So if we don't open it up legislatively to try to come up with some type of fix, ultimately Social Security will go away on its own just because the program is run into the ground. And people are like, well, why does that happen? Well, when Social Security was first created, you know, average life expectancy was 61 and benefits started at 60. Life expectancy right now is mid 80s. So people are living, you know, if they get their benefits at 65, they're still living 20 plus years at that point, still getting benefits. And we've added in programs like disability as well. Um, it used to be in Social Security that we had 11 workers for every retiree. Now we're down to three workers for every retire retiree. So really the system is structurally unsustainable without amending or changing it. Now, there are probably 20 different things that I could list that we can try to improve that situation. Um, but it's going to take all of the above solutions on a table to fix. 
but if we don't start addressing it very soon, the problem is going to get to the point where it's unfixable. And then we're going to end up having real problems when seniors all of a sudden hit that insolvency block and their spending power goes down by 21%. And at that point, I, I can't imagine how people would get by. Right. So one of the things that I've, I've heard kind of thrown around uh, at the podium uh, from the, the president is, you know, possibly having a, a break from payroll taxes. And as a small business owner, that sounds very helpful. Uh, yeah. But it is important for us to understand, you know, the chain reactions, like, so then what does that affect? Um, and so I, I appreciate you um, bringing that to this discussion that, you know, it, it would definitely and immediately, or at least in a very short period of time, impact those of us who have spent our lives paying in. Um, you know, Dan is in that age, age range that, that very soon, you know, we're, we could be looking at um, those kinds of things. And, uh, you know, we've built our life knowing that it won't be there for us <laughs> and yeah. um, preparing to have to be self-sufficient. But not everybody had that foresight. Not everybody had the opportunities um, that we had uh, in order to prepare that way. And so um, I think that that's important for us to really understand, um, you know, how that works, what that payroll tax uh, means to others. Um, moving along into the next uh, topics, of course, you're on Gun Freedom Radio, and so we always like to talk about uh, Second Amendment issues. That is, um, you know, one of our, our core values is trying to be sure that we help people understand our uh, inheritance of freedom and liberties that were fought, bled, uh, you know, people fought, bled, starved, and died to write the the words in our constitution and our bill of rights including the second amendment which is of course the right to the 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 understanding the legal understanding of our god-given right uh to keep and bear arms um so talk to us you know you're you're in our our freedom state but you yep. know every year we have more and more people who move here for all the beautiful reasons to live in Arizona, but they don't necessarily, maybe they grew up in a place where they, they don't necessarily have a, a, a personal connection to their constitutional rights. And so when it comes time to vote on, you know, more, uh, you know, restrictive laws as far as gun ownership goes and that sort of thing, they they are just still of the mindset from where they came from. So um, what can you, at a federal level, because the office you're seeking is a federal level, yeah. um, what can you do to help people all across the nation uh, preserve? I mean, you take an oath when you're elected. You take an oath to protect and preserve and defend the Constitution um, when it comes to uh, AR bands, you know, those are those big, black, scary, you know, they call them assault <laughs> rifles or assault weapons, uh, the AR-15 platform guns, red flag laws, which is one I have a particular uh, um, interest in helping people understand that they might sound good, they all, they sound all calm and sensey, but they're very, very bad. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll lean into our other topics with our next question, but where are you on, on those two particular issues and what can someone at the federal level really do to impact um, our, our laws and our rights? So Eric, I think she's asking you, what do you think about guns? <laughs> <laughs> That's why Dan's here, he cuts to the chase. Yeah. I get it. I, I am pro firearms and a big Second Amendment guy. I mean, I, I own three firearms myself, including an AR-10. So, you know, I, I you know, I feel that, uh, and, and I just like it because the 308 round is, you know, a little bit more heavy duty when it uh, comes out. But my, my, my thought process is that, um, you know, the Second Amendment is not something you can just fight at the federal level. And it's something that has to be fought at the school board level so that we actually teach the Constitution. It's something at the local level that you have to make sure cities are not being, um, you know, stopping us from, you know, carrying uh, weapons. It's a situation where um, at the state level, red flag laws. And then when you talk about the federal level banning of the AR-15, 
um, and in bump stocks and those sort of things that are being taken place. I, I think what has happened is we, we've allowed the opposition and left to change the narrative. You know, that they, they view uh, the Second Amendment and guns and weapons and those sort of things as being something that, well, only hunters do. You know, what's the need? We have a police force. Uh, there, there's no need for guns. And with guns, there's violence, et cetera, et cetera. But really, our founding fathers didn't really intend for us to be protected by the government. They actually didn't write it for people to go hunting. They, they wrote the Second Amendment for us to be the militia, uh, us to be the peacekeepers. The only thing that stops a, an oppressive government from overrunning a population is really that right to bear arms. And we need to understand that and educate that at all levels. Um, just take today. I mean, just today, the Second Amendment is becoming bigger than ever. I mean, you talk Minneapolis, that they're actually talking about defunding the entire police force and saying we need to get rid of cops. Now, I know nobody in our group is advocating getting rid of the police, but if you get rid of the police, who's going to keep the bad criminals at bay from hurting other people? And people right now are legitimately scared. And so when you talk about having the right to protect yourself and bear arms, uh, when you're facing that, police forces uh, are being diminished every single day. I mean, I look within my community, we've been cutting the budget on a police force regularly for almost a decade now. And so crime has been going up in our area and people are concerned. And you have to find some way of having security and protecting your family. And if people can't understand that at the most basic level, then we've done a poor job of educating why the Second Amendment is there. And it's basically to hold back an oppressive government and to protect our loved ones within our own household. It's really that simple. Now, there are other tools that we use guns from in law enforcement to hunting and you know just shooting for the fun of it. But the reality, it's for the security of the individual and that's why it's there. Well, we've seen that with all the people that's coming in the stores lately. You know, as, as Cheryl said, we have a gun shop, AZ Firearms in Avondale. And we are seeing probably, I'd say a minimum of 25% of the people that walk in our door are brand new people that want to, you know, new people that want to own yeah. firearms. And they're, they're afraid. And they know a, a lot of them, they love the police. They know that the police can't get there. You are the first responder to a crime. Yeah. We are. We are the first responder. The police are not. And so I think they're starting to realize that which could be in favor for us down the road with any more gun laws because people are starting to find out when they come in to buy a gun, oh no, I have, a, I have to wait because yeah. they, have, they haven't cleared me yet. I have to wait five days or three days or why can't I just buy a gun and walk out the door with it? Don't people buy guns on the internet that way? <laughs> you know, they don't understand. So uh, the people that have been making decisions on who to vote for don't know the laws. So they don't, they didn't care at the time. Now they're starting to care. So we're starting to see some people are starting to think, hmm, I don't, if I want to buy another gun, I don't want to have to go through that again. So maybe we'll see some changes there. Well, I, I hope. And the other thing too, that I always find interesting is that uh, when you look at the difference of protests that are out there, gun owners, gun owners are hugely responsible people. You know, we're very law abiding. We do everything by the book. And, uh, you know, I know that Governor Whitmer in Michigan was complaining that there was gun toting people in the Capitol and she feared because they have guns. Well, <laughs> one, that actually happens in Michigan all the time. There, there's, uh, that's something that they do as part of a community and culture. But the second thing is there was no violence. There was no broken windows. There was no lighting anything on fire. That There was none of those things that end up happening. So it's interesting that the people that want to take away the guns the most, they're creating the most damage, that they're doing the looting. They're the ones lighting things on fire. And it's just very unfortunate that there's a misrepresentation of just honest, hardworking folks that want to protect their home. And I, I wish that was more of the narrative at the federal level. And that's something I hope to change. Well, maybe those looters that are out there that are doing that kind of stuff can't trust themselves. So how could they figure that anybody else could be responsible to have a firearm, right? 
that happens sometimes. People. You you have a pest thing, so pest control. Is there anything for looters? Do you have anything to <laughs> we can spray? <laughs> Oh man, yeah. we've been super fortunate yes. in uh, in Avondale, Arizona, that uh, any the protests have been actual protests. They haven't been uh, opportunities uh, for rioting and looting, and so um, knock on wood that it stays that way. Um, so just to, as we start wrapping up, um, I really appreciate again you taking this time helping folks understand, because even though we're all in Arizona and we're talking, you know, about some things that are related to Arizona, what happens in one place really impacts all over the nation. And the office you're seeking is a, a federal office. Um, yeah. And so I, I appreciate people, you know, tuning in and listening and, and hanging in there, even though they might think, well, this guy's from Arizona, they're from Arizona, I live in Kansas, what do I care, right? Um, yeah. But uh, these th these things that we're discussing really do impact people all over the nation. And so I, I hope that um, there are people listening that feel encouraged themselves to throw their hat in the ring. Um, people who are listening that realize that, well, if we don't support those who have thrown their hat in the ring, we're going to just keep on getting what we've got. And, yeah. uh, you know, what not that, they say that's the definition of insanity, right? Well, let's just keep doing the same thing, the same routine, and maybe something new will happen. Um, but uh, tell folks how they can, no matter where they are, what they can do to positively impact uh, the work you're trying to do, the, your campaign, and, um, and, and what you hope to bring to uh, our our federal government uh, if you are hired with our votes as a congressperson? Well, I would encourage not only for our campaign, but any conservative people in your area running for office to provide some type of financial support for them. Um, I'll give you an example. My representative, uh, Ann Kirkpatrick, who is a Democrat, she raised 900000 in Arizona. She got $3.5 million out of state and from Washington, D.C. money because these are federal races and controlling the House is very important in controlling the Senate. So if you know someone that's running for a federal office, it's a conservative, donating to their campaign is a way that you can help and provide those resources because these are incredibly competitive races and without your financial support, there's no way to get on the media and counteract some of the negative publicity that they try to uh, put upon us. So I would just ask if you would like to help, I would greatly appreciate it. You can donate on my website. That's rudenforcongress.com, R-U-D-E-N-F-O-R congress.com. And that's a good way to help either myself or other candidates in your area because they need your financial support if they're going to win election in office. Well, thank you so much for what you are doing. And I, I do hope you inspire others to, uh, like I said, dive in themselves or support those who have made that huge decision. Uh, Eric Rudin, we so appreciate you and we'll be following along to see how your campaign is doing. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time and God bless. God Thank you, bless Eric. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. You know, that's scary right there. What he just said was scary. That $900,000 went to Kirkpatrick's campaign in Arizona, but Three million from Washington D.C. That so that's, who is she going to represent, right? Right, because they're supposed oh, right. to be our representatives. Yeah, you think that she's going to say, "Oh, thanks for the three million, but no, we're not going to. No, she's going to whatever they want. I'm sorry, <laughs> it's 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 terrible. But I I never I never knew that. I didn't. Why is that even legal? It, for the state. Okay, so. They are, right they are to influence our state, right? Mm -hmm. They're to work with our people of our state. And yet they get $3 million from Congress, from the federal. No, no, that stops today. Well, that is a thing that is a head scratcher. And I don't exactly know why it's legal. I've never really looked into it. But the other thing that is a huge problem is the way that we um, write and pass bills. And I believe it's Thomas Massey, congressman out of Kentucky, who has brought it several times that each bill should be a, you know, freestanding issue, right? No attachments. No attachments. 
And, you know, because so often they, they just shove all kinds. So it's like, okay, this bill's going to pass. So what else do you want shoved in here? And the PP, is it the PPP or the CARE? One of those was a perfect example of that through this COVID thing, the very first wave of money that was coming out. So all these Democrats, and I'm not, I'm not bashing Democrats. I'm just saying. Kind of are, but that's good. Well, no. I mean, if they're proud of what they did, then they don't feel bashed, right? They were like, well, we really need a bunch of money for some reason to go to the Kennedy Center, you know, the Kennedy Center. Right. So let's shove a bunch of money, you know, earmarked in this thing because this is for sure going to pass. And so we're going to get this thing that we want. Um shoved through. Now, if the people that really were standing on principle said, nope, I am not going to pass this and I'm not going to pass it because of this garbage you've shoved in there, right? We're supposed to be helping, you know, uh, American citizens who are feeling the immediate impact of, of losing jobs and shuttering their businesses and all that sort of thing. Um, if, if they had stood on principle and said, no, we're not going to pass this because of this Kennedy Center money, then what's the headline going to be? Yeah. Right? That they no. don't care about right. American citizens who have shuttered their business right. and because lost they didn't, their job. The Americans don't, they didn't know about that attachment. But those attachments have been going on forever and ever and ever. I mean, think about it, even at home. Hey, honey, I vote, I go fishing this weekend. What do you say? <laughs> well, you know, if we can add that you'll cut the grass before you go fishing and chop the wood, yeah, okay. So it's been going on forever, right? Did I make you chop wood? I don't remember that one. One time you did, remember? I don't, I don't remember that, that one part. One time you made me chop wood. <laughs> anyway. It could have happened. But it's, it's, it's kind of what it is. That's so. so true. All right. Well, we got to wrap up and get out of here. But uh, thank you so much to our awesome listeners. Really, you are what makes these conversations have a broader life than just this wonderful, you know, 45 minutes or so that we spend uh, in studio with, with earphones on and microphone in front of us. Um, when you take these conversations around your dinner tables and you know, talk with your neighbors and talk with your children, that is um, what really keeps these ideas and these messages moving forward. And we value you so much. Um, and we so thank our, our guest today, Norin Eric Rudin. And, um, you know, he, he sounds like he has a full understanding of, of what the job he's seeking entails and uh, how he plans to um, represent the people in District 2 in, in Arizona. That is, we need more of that. And so if you have someone in your area, in your district, that you feel would truly be able to understand you as a citizen and be able to represent you. Um, do what you can to support them because the other side. Uh, we who, see what's whoever, happening. Yeah, whoever yeah. the other person is that they're competing with, uh, sounds like they're getting plenty of help from um, places far away. Yeah, so. and you have to think about that. If you don't like the way the situation is right now, do you think by voting for the same people that are in office right now is going to fix that? If you do, I've got a bridge I want to tell you. Mm -hmm. Because we need real change, real good. I hate to use that. Oh, I hate to use that word. Because look what the change did to us eight years ago. Yeah. But I mean, we do need to think about the fact that, like, I mean, look at in California, Pelosi, look mm -hmm. at, you know, the same old stuff every year, same old stuff every year, and everybody hates it, blah, 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 but they don't do anything about it. So, well, I just won't vote for her. Well, by not voting at all, you're voting for her. Well, that's okay? one of the, the funny things about um, Joe Biden running. For There's a lot of funny things about Joe Biden running. True. A um, lot. But he, uh, just full disclosure, he wouldn't be my pick. I'm sure, I'm sure many people out there listening think that he's a fine pick. Um, he would not be my pick. Um, but that he says that he's going to be the one to really, you know, uh, change everything, you know, fix everything that's wrong. And it's like, you've been there for how long? Right. Right. He's been vice president. What has he done he's that's made change? Right. Yeah. He, 
mm, I'm not so sure about that, but you know, it's a, it's a good line. It, he talks a decent game, I guess, but really I, I'm doing my best. To who? I'm, do, I'm doing my best. But anyway, um, moving along until next time, this is going to be a challenge for you, Dan. Here's, here's your challenge. First of all, this one's not hard, right? Pray for this nation. Holy. Absolutely. We need to pray double, Holy moly. double time. Holy moly, pray for our nation. Because there is some going on out there. You can fill in, you can fill in the blank with my my sigh there, but we please pray for our nation. Pray for our our leaders, our representatives, the people who are trying, the people who need to try. Um, what he picks up his phone. Well, why, why are you tuning me out? I'm trying to find the list of people I'm not going to pray for <laughs> and I can't find them on here. Just pray for all of them. Dan. Uh, Even the ones you don't like, especially the ones you don't like. Be good to each other. No, wait. Have so the reason wait. I picked up my phone okay. is because today we do have a prayer for Alvin Ramirez. He uh, battled the COVID-19. Uh, he's an Avondale police officer. And he passed away yesterday, uh, last night. And I just want to, uh, you know, save my prayer for that and for his family. And um, I am going to pray for my nation. And I am going to pray for future leaders. Um, hopefully we'll get some people in there that will understand what's going on. Yeah, definitely condolences and prayers for um, that officer's family. Um, so, and so many so many people um but anyway be good to each other have a great week and god bless Bye -bye.